You may have noticed earlier this monstrous woofer. Uh, it's sitting on the ground because it weighs 450 pounds. It was designed for the 1939 New York World's Fair, and the designer was Rudy Bozak when he worked at Sonotograph. Uh, we happen to have a picture of Paul Klipsch and Rudy Bozak burying the hatchet. Bozak was considered a fairly respectable competitor. Uh, this speaker, not only is it 27 inches in diameter, it has a six inch diameter voice coil with edge wound aluminum wire. Uh, the field coil copper weighs 65 pounds and the entire speaker is 450. Uh, at the New York World's Fair, at the Lagoon of Nations exhibit, they had a four channel stereo setup they loaded two of these onto a horn that was a quadrant of a circular building. And then they had four of these circular buildings, so they could have four-channel stereo for an audience of about 100,000 people. Uh, the Lagoon of Nations was a multimedia exhibit. It had dancing waters, fireworks, and music. It was quite a big deal at that time. It also used 500 watts per channel of Bloodworth amplification. And these amplifiers weighed seven tons and had their own air conditioning system. Paul Klipsch was always very big into tape recording. In the mid-1950s, he started the Klipsch Tape Division of Klipsch & Associates. Uh, here we have the third edition in that series. This is a Joe Holland quartet. Paul was selling stereo tapes before you could buy stereo LPs. Uh, just yesterday, in a closet in the museum, I discovered the actual production machines for the Klipsch Tape Division. Uh, this is an Ampex 601, a pair of them in stereo. Paul wrote in uh, a letter to one of his customers later that he lost about $10,000 in the Klipsch Tape Division, which uh, was a huge sum of money in the mid-1950s. In the 1960s, it appears that Paul may have been giving uh, professional tape sales another shot. Uh, he did not get into production again, but this is an Ampex 350, and this is quite a professional machine. In this display, we have an Ortronic uh, tape player. Uh, this was designed in the mid-1960s by J. Herbert Orr of Opelika, Alabama. Paul Klipsch was a friend of Orr and did use Orr as a supplier for his tapes for the Klipsch Tape Division. This is a very interesting machine because it is a cassette. It's not an 8-track, but it was a contender for the 8-track market. Uh, ultimately, the Lear design won out. Uh, these are quite rare. Uh, it is a Model P100. We also have, as our latest tape machine in the museum, it's a 1987 gift from Bill Livingstone, who was the chief editor of Stereo Review. Uh, he gave that to Paul, and uh, we've added it as the most recent tape recording device in the museum. Here's an item that's somewhat out of context. I couldn't bring myself to throw it away. It is the last active mold for the K400 horn. I'm going to try to open it. It's extremely heavy. Inside you can see the core, at the very end of the core is actually wood uh, because it was uh, expendable, uh, it would not last very long, so they had wooden patterns. Uh, this thing probably weighs a good ton. This black speaker is significant because it is really the beginnings of Klipsch professional loudspeakers. Uh, it's called the LB76, LB standing for Little Bastard. It was built uh, from 1976 until 1978. Only 16 were made and this is the last one. The lighter colored speaker on top was referred to as an LB15. Uh, it came some years earlier 1970-71. Uh, I would be very interested in finding some more information on these uh, because it is obviously a predecessor to the LB76. The third and 
and final room in our museum is devoted primarily to the works of Paul Klitsch. I'll try to give you a chronological run-through of the different models. The first Klipsch horn is designated the X3 and the X5. These were the first successful prototypes of the woofer and high-frequency horn, respectively. Uh, this unit is currently on loan to New Mexico State University. The earliest one that we have here currently is this number 13. It was the last of 12 built by Baldwin Piano Company, the woofer cabinet that is. Uh, this unit actually went to Consumer, Consumers Research Magazine. Uh, we have the 1948 edition of the Consumer Research Bulletin and it has the first review of the Klipsch horn, and it was the best thing they'd ever heard. After the original 12 Baldwin units were built, Paul built another seven units in a local cabinet shop, and that was prior to buying this building to become a, his real factory. Uh, we have two of those units, uh, both of which were sold to Victor Brosiner of New York. Uh, Brosiner was our Eastern representative at that time. Number 18 here shows the sparse original cosmetics, almost none. <laughs> Number 20, Mr. Brosiner applied some pretty serious cosmetics. He made the thing look like a liquor cabinet. Uh, we do have the literature on the model. Uh, Brosiner bought the majority of Klipsch horns in the first two years of production. In 1953, Paul Klipsch and Arthur Fiedler came to an agreement to use Fiedler's name in Paul's advertising. Uh, in return for that, Paul gave him this Klipsch horn, and it's actually considered Fiedler Gray in the logbook. Uh, we were, got this speaker back uh, several years ago. It's still operational, uh, and we also have the contract for the advertising agreement with Fiedler. Fiedler was most famous as the conductor of the Boston Pops. This is a very unusual version of the Klipsch horn. I have on top a horn that is in here, and it has this rotating vein. Uh, this was for use with an organ, and it operated very similarly uh, to a Leslie speaker. There were very few of these sold. This particular one is 1958, uh, but he was working with this even earlier. It is called the Tremulant model, but Paul often referred to it as the wobulator. Some of the latest Klipsch horns we have in here are from 1986. This pair of Klipsch horns went to Richard Heiser when he did the review in Audio Magazine of the Klipsch horn. Uh, this was quite a good review. Richard Heiser was one of the greatest minds to ever touch audio, and he was a personal friend of Paul Klipsch. This ebony cabinet has never had components in it, but it was built and shipped to Audio Magazine for the 1986 review, and here it is on the cover. We have two different versions of Klipsch horn cutaways. The one I'm leaning on was done in the 1970s. Uh, there were 12 of these built. Uh, I know where three of them are. Two we have. One is at New Mexico State. I would be interested if any of the others still exist. Uh, another cutaway, one of the most recent, is 1980 cutaway, and it was utilized in our pocket facts brochure, uh, this picture here. There was an earlier cutaway done in the 1950s. Uh, it was destroyed in one of the museum basement floods. There are postcards out there picturing that clip shorn. Uh, I have a few of them. Uh, it may be something that a clip collector would like to look for. Paul Klipsch's last design was that of the Jubilee. Roy Delgado assisted in that design, and this is one of three units that were on display at the 1999 Consumer Electronics Show in a three-channel array. By the mid-50s, there were at least 30 competitive corner horns on the market. Here we have only three examples. This first one is a Lowther TP1A, the second one is an Electrovoice Aristocrat, and the third one is a Jensen Imperial. The Aristocrat is interesting in that there were several different Electrovoice models, 
where they paid Paul Cliffs royalties to use his patents. Uh, that included the aristocrats, several versions, uh, the Georgian, the patrician, and a few others. 